Hey, Ashley from All the Things Industry, the place where we're passionate about sharing those unwritten hints and tips in industry. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm super grateful you're here. I hope you're having a great day. And I wanted to share this case with you because it really reminds me of when I was a brand new dentist or even under five years. You know, I, I would find this is a Maxery second molar, and this is one of our students from a course a few years ago. And what had happened was they were they had removed all the decay from a um, max three second molar and they were wondering you know we, so that's the typical stage you remove all the decay and see if the tooth is restorable and then what had happened was they finally did all the restoration beautiful restoration beautiful contact and then they were uh, you know it's about the time to tackle the root canal so the tooth was diagnosed with symptomatic irreversible pitis with normal apical tissues and then what happens is they get in and they can't find distal buccal. So that was really the question was, you know, can you help me find distal buccal? So what happened was I sat down, put on my camera and let's take a look. And this is kind of what I was looking at. So kudos to the student who had this fairly, you know, great access and they stopped at the right time. And that's the beauty, you know, that's probably tip number one of let's say four tips of doing molar root canals is that with endo, you can stop at any time, especially, and the reason why this student stopped here is because they were afraid of perforating. And they kind of, they hadn't lost their landmarks because you can see we still got the buck, you know, this is the buckle cusp, this is the paddle cusp, here's the mesial wall, this is, you know, kind of where MB1 was, and this is palate. So they hadn't lost their, they hadn't lost their way, but they were afraid of perforating. And what are the things I'm looking for? Well, you're gonna see me change before I do anything. Before I start monkeying around, I'm going to take a look and see, you know, kind of what does the landscape look like. And when I sit down and look, I see like this does not look like bone. It looks like potentially pulp tissue. As well, the distal buccal canal, it looks, it's right about here. And in a maxillary second molar, you know, it's a little more constricted. And you'll see, in, I'm not going to let the cat out of the bag, but what happens here is you'll see kind of where the distal buccal canal is down the road. I just let out the, anyways. So what I'm looking at, you know, distal buckle should be about here. You know, in my mind, is that a calcification or what is it? Now, the other thing that I'm looking at as well is, okay, here's the level of the restoration. It's not that deep. It's not a large restoration. On the radiograph, it looked a little more deep, but it, looked, it looks fine here, totally restorable. And this is the gingival aspect of the, of, of the restoration. So it's actually in line with kind of where the, the access holes are, if you may. And... You know, are those access holes? Are those perforations? And so I'm kind of looking at that level. It, this looks actually the same. So what's going through my mind is like, well, it's probably just the roof of the pulp chamber. So what I'm going to do is, and if you're at home, you know, or if you're in a clinic and you don't know, you know, have I perforated or not, this is the best time to just stop, take a radiograph. A periapical radiograph is usually seems to be kind of the go-to, especially for endo, but actually a bite wing, if you can get a bite wing, it's a great radiograph because it's fairly perpendicular to the occlusal table, especially the, you know, the occlusal, the coronal portion of the tooth. And you can actually see, you know, where are you? This is a great case because it's a wide open pulp chamber. And that's why the, the student actually tackled it, open pulp chamber. And then, so what I'm thinking is like, well, it was an open pulp chamber. This looks like pulp tissue, not bone, because I've been down that road a few times in my career. I can tell you that. Bone does not look like that. Bone uh, looks like bone and especially through a hole like that. The other thing you could have done is take an apex locator and take a file, put it in there. And she had done that before. And I forgot, I didn't think about it at that moment, but she did get uh, working length on some of, on the mesiobuccal canal and the palatal canal. So what I'm thinking is that the roof is just not unroofed. It's still there. And let's go ahead and, so I didn't take a, pair, a, a bite wing radiograph. I feel, you know, I'm not, it's not that I'm confident, I'm just, I'm cautious, but I have a feeling that what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to slightly take that round burr and just unroof that and see if I can, let's see what happens. And sure enough, it looks like we're like, okay, we're unroofing some more pulp chamber, so that's good. And again, what was going through my mind was just that it's at the, it's equidistant, equal height to the level of the gingival portion of that box. So I'm like, well, I don't think we're perforated and I'm using the measurements, especially when I go straight in. Another way you can do that is use your long shank uh, burr. This is a Munz burr, so I don't have the measurements on it, but you know, it's roughly from the mesobuccal cusp to the roof of the pulp chamber, six millimeters. And this does not look like it's more than six millimeters. So 
I was fairly confident, still cautious, that I could unroof that just with my Munzburr. And then what I'm doing here is I'm just pushing the pulp tissue just to make sure that, yeah, we're in the pulp. It's not osseous tissue. And then the next thing all I'm going to do is, and is take my endo zebra. Let's go ahead and speed this up here. So there you can see right there. So all I wanted to do is just unroof from the mesial buckle to the palate. And now I'm going to do is I'm going to take my endo zebra. It's a non-cutting tip. Let's go ahead and slow that down right here. So this is a rounded tip if you hadn't used it. Um, there's a whole bunch of different brands or diamond coated ones. We've just been using these for years. So we're just going to keep using them. I'm going to spin it at 200,000 RPM. And then I'm going to place that right to the bottom of the top of the pulpal floor. And that burr is just going to follow around. So my dental assistant at the time, she's doing a great job blowing air to see what I'm so I can see what's going on in the mirror. But normally with an endo zebra, it's really hard to see what's doing. I'm actually watching. I'm actually watching what's going on here and I'm feeling. So that's about it. Now, say for example, you're, you know, you're two hours into this appointment and you take your endo zebra and the patient's starting to get tired. You can actually stop the procedure at this point. This is essentially a pul pulpotomy. Oh, because there were already files put down the mesial buccal canal. I don't know if the if we could leave this as a vital pulp therapy because the pulp had already been irritated. But you could arguably, had you not put files down there, you could have, depending on the diagnosis, left this as a vital pulp therapy, place some sort of bioceramic on top of the of the, the pulp stumps here and left it. What's really funny is that actually in all the vital pulp therapies that I intend to do, there's always one orifice that's bleeding. And of course I go to do just a vital pulp uh, uh, a pulp, uh, just a pulpectomy, and none of these are bleeding. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is like the ideal one. So you could, you could leave this as a pulpotomy had you not placed files down, because there, look at, there's the the coronal portion of the distal buckle. So there's our distal buckle. <laughs> so look how easy that was. I mean, with a lot of experience, but you know that's why I'm putting this video on here because had you had an, if you have an, if you're in the same boat, and you have an open pulp chamber, that endo zebra can save so much time. So here's our, our distal buccal uh, orifice. Now, if you're planning on doing a stage two, which is happening here, you could actually leave this. There's a couple great articles. I'll put them in the, in the comments below. They're old. I mean, this has been going on for years. You could leave this as a pulpotomy. The patient's acute symptoms will be removed 99% of the time, and then you can bring the patient back and finish stage two. So you don't even need to take a you know, open up the coronal two thirds, get down to working length, all this other stuff. It's a great time to say, hey, listen, we're gonna stop and be done. But what I elected to do in this case was I just wanted to open up the coronal two thirds just with a wave one gold. And we'll, we're gonna stop the video there, but what this is the next stage. And if you wanna continue with this, if you wanna see the rest of the endo, it's gonna be coming up down the road. Um, you can also, this technique, what we're talking about is actually in our course at lthingsendo.ca. If you want to continue the road and how we tackle these types of cases, you get a couple free courses along with it, including maxillary molars. But this is typically what's going to happen. We're going to open up the coronal two thirds, and then we're going to remove all that pulp tissue. Now, like you don't have to, but it, this takes me, it, it takes a little bit of time. You can see I'm pulling out the radicular pulp, and then we'll be prepped for stage two down the road. Anyways, I hope that's really helpful. I'm super grateful you're here. Let me know in the comments below if you've been in this situation. I'm almost certain you have because I've been in it multiple times when it's brand new and sometimes even as an old timer. Thank you so much for being here and we'll talk to you soon. Cheers.